when influenza came along, national public health leaders said, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was referred to as Spanish flu. That was echoed in nearly every place in the country. The Surgeon General said, if proper precautions are taken, you have no cause for alarm. In other words, they did nothing and they lied to the public. Your book describes uh, a, a tragedy of unbelievable scale in the United States alone 675,000 people died, which is comparable to about a million point seven. This is in 1918. What are we facing now? How does this resonate with you? This, this, your history of 1918 must play in your head all the time as you're watching television, as you're thinking about what's going on. Uh, a little bit too much, uh, right? Uh, well, you know, they're, they're both respiratory viruses, obviously. Fortunately, this virus is I think considerably less lethal than 1918. Unfortunately, this virus is much more contagious than 1918. So even with the lower fatality rate, uh, which we're still not sure exactly what it is, uh, but it does clearly seem to be lower than 1918. Uh, even with that lower fatality rate, because more people are going to be infected, we're still facing you know incredibly dramatic, unfortunate numbers. One of the most chilling moments in your book about 1918 comes when you compare Philadelphia to St. Louis. What happened there? Philadelphia was one of the first hit cities hit. They again echoed the line that the national government was uh, putting out there. They had a huge Liberty Loan Parade scheduled. Virtually everyone in the public health community and the medical community wanted that canceled except the public health commissioner. He was part of the political machine, had no backbone. So the uh, parade went forward, and just like clockwork, uh, roughly 48 hours later, the disease exploded in Philadelphia. It ended up with about 14,500 deaths, if my memory serves. About two-thirds of them died in a 14-, 15-week period beginning in late September 1918. St. Louis imposed all sorts of social distancing measures early and, and had a much better outcome. They did, in fact, flatten the curve. A question. There seems to be a minority opinion, but it's one that I've, I've heard come up, and it, and it certainly influenced, at least for a while, Boris Johnson's thinking in, in the UK. Oh, the herd immunity thing? Yes. The idea is you let the uh, influenza sweep through the community, the death rate is higher, but you haven't destroyed your economy, because if you destroy your economy, the downstream effects of that are even worse on the public health, that, that a prolonged depression would lead to all kinds of horrible public health consequences, even worse than the flu. What, what do you think of that rationale? Well, I think it's a legitimate question to ask. The question is, what price are you going to have to pay to get there? Right now, I think it looks like the number of deaths that might occur would be high enough that that would argue against uh, that approach. I actually do agree with Trump on one thing, and that is once we get past this, I think the economy will surge. There are still going to be, unfortunately, a tremendous number of dislocated workers. You know, hopefully Congress, as we are taping this, you know, Congress is trying to figure out what they were going to do. Uh, hopefully that will be addressed. Something like uh, I heard, you know, Schumer say the the government should guarantee four to six months of uh, full compensation for those who are unemployed. And if we do that, that will significantly minimize uh, the economic impact. And again, there will be demand for everything once we get through the cycle. And we will get through the cycle. Obviously, the only way that this virus disappears, and it's just real eradication is not. Like, it's not going to happen. This virus is here forever. Right. Is it is either through herd immunity, where the vast majority of people are immune in some way, having had it, or a vaccine comes along and protects a, a huge number of people. Right. Or We're both. told that with the vaccine, that's at least a year out. Herd immunity, nobody really wants to absorb the losses that come with that. So how do you see the waves of this occurring over the, you know, I, I guess to be a historian is by definition to have the luxury 
not to predict the future, but rather to examine the past, but indulge us for, for this one time. How do you expect to see this in terms of the science, in terms of the virus itself playing out in the next year or two or three? If we can, quote, flatten the curve, phrase you've never heard, right? And if the healthcare system can function well, then we will have accomplished a lot. You know, I, I would expect to see this come and go. You know, we may get lucky. Most viruses uh, do, in fact, in high humidity and high heat, do less well outside the body. So we may get a respite in, as, as summer comes. But I would expect to see, essentially, several waves of this. Waves of this scale? I would I would expect to see up and down, up and down, at least several cycles of that. And I would think uh, the next cycle would probably be less and then less. You, you wrote recently in the New York Times, whether we use that time well, meaning the time that we have to uh, get out in front of this, although we're, however belatedly, we're, whether we use that time well will determine whether a month from now the United States looks like Italy, where the virus seems out of control, or South Korea, which seems to have gained control by testing more than 270,000 of its 51 million people. Does the United States now resemble Italy more than it does South Korea? Well, on the plus side, I think we've instituted the social distancing uh, much earlier than Italy. Uh, they started out with quarantine, but it was an extremely leaky quarantine. Uh, so it really had no effect uh, in terms of testing. Obviously, we're way, 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 way behind. You can't isolate someone if you don't know they're sick. You can't trace their contacts if you don't know they're sick. Uh, I have a lot of concern. I'm over 70, so I'm a target audience. My wife's over 70. She's a target audience. If you're infected with the virus, it can take anywhere from two to 14 days before you uh, get sick. It's important that that point be made to everyone so that they won't lose heart when they think that we're doing all these things and yet the case counts are still going up. There's a real time lag between uh, the institution of any restrictions and any benefit that we see. Real keys to success is compliance. If people don't heed the advice, then we're in trouble. What do you recommend, as people are trying to live their lives and be as safe as possible, what are the key things that you recommend in your, with your great historical knowledge and your knowledge of what's going on now? I would say what's going on, what we are doing, what most of us are doing anyway. Uh, the social distancing, that doesn't mean you can't communicate with people. You can communicate over the internet. Uh, I was just walking uh, through the French Quarter. People are you know, stopping on the street from different sides of the street, talking across, you know, and there's actually a good feeling when you have that human connection. I think it's very important.